Hello, welcome back for lesson four and our final lesson of our Bible study creed and deed here at Word of Life. As always, I'm Pastor Schoen, pastor here at Word of Life. I just want to again thank you for being here over these last three sessions and today for our fourth and final session as we look at the last part of the creeds, kind of what we find at the end of the creeds and we see it as part of what the work of the role of the Holy Spirit as God is in kind of the church and the life of the church throughout the course of time, even as we speak today. But the petitions that we're going to talk about today more specifically deal with kind of life for you and me and how God plays into the life and what we do in our daily lives. So we want to give thanks for that and we also want to celebrate uh, the work of God for you and for me in these ways. And so as always, we do want to take a time for prayer. So I encourage and invite you, would you please pray with me as we begin this study? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for being Lord over the church and Lord over our salvation. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these last three sessions where we've been able to examine your nature as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask that you would be with us today as we look at these last few petitions and think about what it means for our faith and the faith of those around us, especially the interactions we have with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, the last petitions of the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed are going to play in a little bit with what we find in the Athanasian Creed as well. So let me dive right in and let me read the last couple of petitions or the last few parts of the Apostles' Creed. Then I'm going to read the last couple of parts of the Nicene Creed and we'll talk about them and we'll talk about kind of why the writers of either the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed and then the Athanasian Creed put these petitions in there uh, so that we would have a confession and have something to stand on in our faith. So the Apostles' Creed, now remember last week we talked about the work of the Holy Spirit. And in the Apostles' Creed, at the end of the Creed, in what we call the third petition, or the third article, says this, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But then the Apostles' Creed says this, The Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now that sounds a lot like what we're going to see in the Nicene Creed, which is going to come along uh, a little bit later in the life of the church, but it is a little bit different because of different issues or different kind of doctrinal problems or conversations that were being had at the church at the time. So when Athanasius and those who were around him were writing the Nicene Creed, remember Athanasius didn't write the Athanasian Creed, it was named that in his honor, but Athanasius had a big hand or was very instrumental in writing the Nicene Creed in the mid-300s AD. And so the last part of the Nicene Creed then says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. That's a lot of the work of the Holy Spirit there. And then the uh, Nicene Creed says this, and I, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So there's going to be a little bit of a difference or a few differences in kind of the way that the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed are written and kind of some of the, the issues that they're talking about. So let's start with this idea from what it says in the Apostles' Creed, the Holy Christian Church. So a couple of things there, and we're going to see it written in a little bit of a different way in the Nicene Creed. It says, I believe in one Holy Christian and Apostolic Church. So, a little bit of a difference there, but a couple of things that both creeds affirm. That the church that we have today, and the church that has existed throughout the course of time, God calls to be holy. He calls you and me, and He calls the church when we get together, when we have fellowship with one another, when we go out into the world and we do acts and works of service and charity for other people, uh, when we conduct ourselves in front of the world, whether it be in the media or whether it be in conversations um, on behalf of uh, nations and, and kind of the, uh, the way in which we want to present the gospel of Christ to a, a larger world and in a larger context 
context, we are called to be holy. We are called to be a holy church that is um, exuding the righteousness of Christ, um, that we should not be doing things, obviously, that go against the ways of God. Now, obviously, we know that we are sinful people, and we know that sin happens, and we know that there are times in which we don't do the things of God. Um, but when, especially, we put our uh, best face forward, and when we're um, in front of people, we, we want to make sure that we're doing the right things, that we're acting in a holy and righteous way. And, and the way we um, write our lists of, of, of interactions and way we, ways we um, deal with the world around us, uh, we want to be holy. Um, holy means not just that we keep the word of God, but it also means the compassionate work of, of what we do and, and who we are called to be. So in regard to some of the issues or some of the ways in which the church disagrees with the conduct of the world and policies that the world might say is acceptable according to what we have here, the ways that are sometimes pleasing to the flesh or pleasing to the body uh, or pleasing to us in, in our humanity and sometimes our weakness and our sinfulness. Uh, the church has to understand that, yes, if we are called to be holy, we are called to uh, affirm what we believe, but that doesn't mean that we um, are so stand offish and say, no, we can't interact with you, or we can't do this, or we can't do that because of this. Jesus went even to the people who he disagreed with, or that God would kind of disagree with their lifestyles and, and kind of some of the, the, the sinful habits and things that they did. Jesus didn't let that be a barrier to the compassion of God being extended to the world. So, in unfortunately, our world and even especially here in America, it really, really rears its ugly head. But we've seen a lot of places where the Christian church has taken a position where it's going to be more standoffish than welcoming and, and, and seeking to create and foster and sustain relationships. Now, we have really struggled as a church. I'm not talking word of life, but I'm talking the church um, kind of in, in its construct as a, as a uh, church around the world. The, the, the church has really struggled with kind of where do we draw the line and how do we do these things yet maintain our holiness. That's where we have got to ask the intervention of God to help us. And we have to understand that even though we may try to be as compassionate as we can in kind of what we do, and we don't always do that. If, if you're caught up in American politics, you're going to see that unfortunately there is a lot of pastors and there is a lot of churches who may think that they're trying to defer to the holiness of God and, on, and being uh, on the side of righteousness and holiness, but they do it from a very sharp and very coarse perspective, and they aren't as focused on the compassionate nature of who Christ is. And sometimes they are that way, but the media and people on social media and uh, the ways of the world will uh, take and distort kind of who they are and kind of what they do for their own agenda. And for those times, we just have to work with what we can in trying to remember that we are called to be compassionate, even in the midst of kind of some of the dialogues that we have about where we disagree or some of the ways in which we have to make a stand and say, um, we don't accept that as a church. We do not believe that the Bible calls that an acceptable practice or that's an acceptable belief to have. I've had a lot of conversations with people both in the church and outside of the church, people that are Lutheran, people that belong to other denominations, about places and ways in which we disagree. But we're all trying to maintain a sense of holiness, and we're all trying to figure out how can the grace and the love of God be extended to people as much as possible while maintaining a righteous and holy perspective on things. Jesus did not allow his interaction and his fellowship with those who 
um, kind of had been led astray by the ways of the world uh, to taint his holiness and to taint his righteousness. He was able to be righteous and be holy and remain sinless even in the midst of kind of whatever else was going on with those who were sinful that he was in fellowship with and trying to maintain relationship with so that they would understand the grace and the mercy of God would be so much greater for them than succumbing to the, 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 the pleasures and, and the, um, the joys of, of the moment. And so we have to kind of try and accomplish that in the same way. God calls his church, he calls you and he calls me in the midst of all of the temptations that are out there to remain holy and to present his church present his name as a place of righteousness and holiness, something higher than the things of this world that tend to sink or, or bring us down below where we need to be, that level of, of righteousness that God himself expects for his church and his people. So uh, that is the big thing that we kind of talk about there, uh, that, that, that God calls us or calls his church to be holy. But then he also calls us in the Nicene Creed, I believe, and, and we are called to believe this, that we are a one holy Christian and apostolic church. We are called to be a united church. And, and, and unfortunately, that just doesn't happen. Uh, there's a lot of different interpretations out there of how to read and understand the Bible. But we have to main, make sure um, that we maintain our unity, our, our oneness with those who are Christians in the faith as well, whether they be uh, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, whether they be Baptist or Methodist, non-denominational. The, the grace of Christ and, and the message of the creeds, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bring us together. That even when there's a lot of things that we disagree with and, and there's a lot of things that we maybe don't uh, agree as far as interpretation goes, when it comes to the core message of, of who God is in His righteousness, in His holiness, and especially in His grace and favor for you and me uh, by uh, salvation uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, if, if we maintain that and we maintain what the creeds have to say, uh, then we are united more than we realize. And a lot of times as Christians, we tend to focus on the disagreements or the places where we're a little bit divided on our understanding of what the Bible has to say. But as I've said many times, and I've said in many places in, in, in different Bible studies and in sermons, there are so many more places where we agree with other denominations and with other Christians that it so overwhelms the, the disagreements that we have. And we should be focusing on being one united church and, and one church um, that, that brings the message of God and, and, and His righteousness and His works for you and me together so that we can celebrate that as opposed to um, kind of uh, fostering our differences and continuing to try to splinter off more and more and more and say, well, just because of that one little thing, we can't ever be together. We can't ever uh, work together. We can't ever fellowship together. There are some churches that will say if there's even one little disagreement, um, you guys go do your thing. We're going to be over here in the corner or doing our thing and never are we going to be able to meet or do things or kind of work together and, and it's a real shame when churches do that and and they're just kind of closing themselves off to to fellowship because they believe 100 that there's no compromise that there's no way that even in the name of jesus we can work together because of one or two or three or five kind of disagreements that we might have God calls us and the creeds call us to something more, that we must be united and we must always be searching and seeking out unification, bringing people together. This, this is where we need the intervention of our Lord. We, knew, we need the renewing spirit of Jesus, uh, as, as uh, 2 Corinthians 5 says, where, where all things in Christ become a new creation. We must seek this new creation that only our Lord Jesus, through His grace and through His work and through His mercy, can give to us. We must be seeking to become as his church, a new creation where we come together as one church, as one group of Christians, one group of people, one body of Christ working for the glory of God, the salvation of the world. 
too often we just don't want to pursue that. We just think it's too hard, too difficult. I've got too much other stuff I've got to do in the church. I've got too much other stuff I've got to do in my daily life with my family, with my kids, at work, whatever it might be. I don't necessarily need to pursue unification. It would be a great idea. But when it happens, it'll happen. I'm just going to do my other stuff and, and kind of do what I need to do. In the meantime, I'll let maybe sometimes somebody else worry about that. I'll celebrate it when it happens, um, but it's too overwhelming and I don't even know where to begin. God calls us to find a place for that to begin. And he calls each and every one of us to be a part of it, where we pursue, we celebrate, and we glorify God, looking forward to being one church. And then also it says here, this holy Christian church, or holy Christian and apostolic church. Now, as Lutherans, we substituted the word, and, and, and the, 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 the real word instead of Christian here is Catholic church. Now, the Lutheran church changed the word Catholic to Christian because they didn't want it to become a stumbling block thinking that we all had to be part of the Roman Catholic church under the auspices of the Pope and, and kind of Roman Catholic doctrine. The the word Catholic itself means universal. And the word Catholic um, has this connotation, this idea of we're all universally brought together, not just um, around the world, but, but for all time. And so the Athanasian Creed, which was written hundreds of years after the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, and as I said before, uh, named kind of in honor of St. Athanasius, here's what the Athanasian Creed says uh, uh, about this idea of being Catholic or uh, universal or being brought together around the world as, as this, this unified, universal church throughout the course of time uh, with one kind of uh, core message. It says this, Whoever will be saved shall above all else hold the Catholic or the universal faith, which faith except everyone keeps whole and undefiled, without doubt he will perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in three persons and three persons in one God, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. And then it's going to go on and on to kind of unpack that and dissect exactly kind of what that means. And, and so the Athanasian Creed sees the, the, the universality of the church, the, the, the Catholic idea of the church rooted in, uh, if we can't get it right about God himself, we can't possibly get everything else that the Bible talks about right. And so we've got to focus, and we've got to focus extremely well on understanding the nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That the Father has His specific role, the Son, Jesus, has His specific role, and the Holy Spirit has His specific role. That they're each a different person in the nature of the Trinity, but they're still just one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Uh, neither is any lesser, neither is any greater in respect to the nature of the Trinity. And so we've got to uh, believe that, we've got to trust that, even if we don't fully understand or fully grasp it. We must ask God to make our faith strong enough to take it in accordance with what the Bible says, that if we believe that, then if, and if we believe the, the nature of who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then no matter some of these other differences that we might have and some of these other um, kind of smaller um, differences of interpretation, uh, it doesn't stop us from all being Christian, all being part of this Catholic or universal, united church throughout the course of time. That the saints uh, a thousand years ago, 1,500 years ago, if they were believing what the Bible said about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's the same faith that we have today. And that's the same Catholic or universal faith. That's the same faith that God is going to use to save people back in the day as He's going to save us today. He's going to save people if Jesus hasn't returned a thousand years from now. And so then the Athanasian Creed kind of, after saying all of these different things, then talks about Jesus and talks very specifically about the role of Jesus. And the Athanasian Creed then ends with these words. 
And this is speaking specifically about our Lord Jesus, at whose coming all men will rise again with their bodies and will give an account of their works. And they that have done good will go into life everlasting, and they that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic faith which, except a man believe faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. There is an element to our faith that we respond to the gospel and we don't succumb to sin and just wallow in our sins and say, um, there's nothing I can do right. Um, but, but the Christian faith, the Bible, um, compels us through the grace of Christ to pursue something better in our life, to do things that are better, uh, that live, as the, as the creeds say, this holy, righteous faith, this, this idea um, that, that, that Christ's gospel, uh, that the message of forgiveness and, and what Jesus lived and died and rose again for means something to us. It means something to our churches. It means something to our individual lives where we're in our life with our, 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 our work and, and our lives and our family. Uh, that grace, as it affects us, it should be used by us as a ministering agent to show the mercy of God to those around us. That we don't let God's grace just become something that we take for granted. If the gospel is something that we truly value and we truly treasure, then we're going to pursue what that gospel means in living it out in our daily life. And the Athanasian Creed says, this is something that we as Christians must be doing. It's a reflection of who we believe God is and the work that we believe God is doing in our lives, in our church, and in the world. And so when we are one holy Catholic or Christian church, this is what we are pursuing. And it's built on the works of the apostles, the prophets of the Old Testament, and especially the apostles of the New Testament. Now, the reason that the Nicene Creed kind of put this in there, where you don't necessarily find that in the Apostles' Creed, at the time of the writing of the Nicene Creed, um, there was a, a sharp division among some people at that time uh, that the writings of the New Testament, and there was a lot of disagreement as to which writings should be in the Bible and which were authoritative to um, for us to govern our lives by. Uh, because at that time, there was still a lot of disagreement about whether this book or that book should actually be a part of the Bible. And it wasn't until even later than when the Athanasian Creed, or kind of during that process time, that there was still kind of... Uh, wondering what works and what books should be in the Bible. But Athanasius and those who were around him thought it was important enough for us to confess uh, throughout the course of all time that our lives, our Bible, our authoritative um, uh, understanding of God must be rooted in the teaching of the apostles. It can't just be the works of the Old Testament. It can't just be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the Gospels, but also the book of Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the book of Hebrews, the book of 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, the book of Jude, the book of Revelation, and on and on down list of, of all of those works that were written by the apostles after the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they had value because the Holy Spirit was inspiring those writers to record and document the faith of God for you and me. And their teachings are just as important as the works of the Old Testament. And alongside the message and the teachings and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, give us value for our faith and our ministries even today. And so for the writers of the Nicene Creed, it was important to delineate and to put there very specifically that the faith, the confession that we have, has to be built on the work and the writings of the apostles as well as what we find given over the course of centuries in the Old Testament as well.
And so then uh, we have this idea from the Apostles' Creed, the communion of saints. And that kind of goes back to this kind of idea of the Catholic Church or, or this the, the, the Catholicity, the universality of the church. Communion of saints. If we're to be one church as what the, the Nicene Creed says, the Apostles' Creed says the communion of saints, it reminds us um, that we are supposed to be in fellowship with one another. And as a church and as individuals, uh, we are called to fellowship, uh, not just in, uh, between us as, as individuals here at Word of Life Lutheran Church or any other church that we might go to, but churches need to fellowship with one another. Churches that are standoffish and, and live on an island and, and churches that have no, or that fi- f- feel like they have no business or no need to reach out beyond themselves and to really fellowship with one another, they're doing a disservice to the confession that we are called to have. And if they think they're too busy to do this, they're really downplaying the confession that they make on a regular basis, whether their church does it weekly, monthly, um, some other kind of regularly scheduled activity. They're not fully living out the faith that they confess to have. Personally, and if you know me, and if you know Uh, my history as a pastor, I take this petition of the Apostles' Creed and kind of the reflection of it in the Nicene Creed where we're called to be one holy Christian and apostolic church. I take this petition and this group of petitions along with the communion of the saints very, very seriously. I very, very much believe that churches do not do enough to fellowship with one another. I have exhausted myself trying to fellowship with other churches and get us as a church, not just at Word of Life, but as a church uh, communally, to believe in the idea of fellowship with one another, life together, doing works of community, charity, service, partnering with other organizations in order to put the best foot forward for the Christian church, not just Word of Life Lutheran Church, in the community around us. But if we are going to have this communion, this fellowship with one another, we must believe it as much as we confess it. We must live it as much as we confess it. And to my dying breath, I pray that the Spirit and God Himself as the Spirit would inspire me and inspire His church to pursue even more this communion, this fellowship with one another as individual Christians, but also as churches, wherever they might be. We can fellowship with churches that are halfway around the world if we so desire. We can fellowship and we should be fellowshipping with churches that are just down the street and maybe a mile away. There should be no limitations as long as we are united in the confessions that we make, in the ways in which we do things together as Christians. And and then the, 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 the Nicene Creed says this, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission or for the forgiveness of sins. And this petition makes a lot of different denominations and some non-denominational churches really kind of nervous. Because it talks about, and and in the history of the church, it's only more of a recent thing that came around about 500 years ago is kind of really where you started to see it pick up steam. It's been there in bits and pieces in different ways because obviously it was big enough and important enough for Athanasius and those who wrote the Nicene Creed to need to put this in there 1,700 years ago. But we really started to see it pick up steam um, in conjunction with the Protestant Reformation. Now, not us as Lutherans, but there were other Protestant groups that were really kind of diverging from the history of the church and in what they believed about the sacramental nature of baptism. That baptism brings forgiveness to us um, through God. And and God works through baptism just as much as He does through Holy Communion. Um, It's a sacramental idea that it brings forgiveness. There's a lot of churches that do not believe uh, that baptism or communion uh, merit salvation or, or grant us the message of salvation. If we believe and we acknowledge and we confess that there is one baptism 
for the remission or for the forgiveness of sins, we acknowledge that baptism has a sacramental nature. It was important enough for Athanasius and those who were writing the Nicene Creed to put this in there as a confession of what was going on at the time, that there was this disagreement about the nature of baptism, that, that baptism was not the work of God, that it was strictly something that we do. Athanasius, 1,700 years ago, and those who were with him said, a baptism is more than just something that we do, and more than just a confession that we make. Yes, that's a part of it, but it's also the work of God for you and me. He gives his grace through baptism, and it's not just a baptism for adults, but for people of all ages, including infants. That's the nature of the mercy of God working through baptism. And, and, and it's interesting that, that it says one baptism. There's different churches that believe um, that you can have multiple baptisms. That if you're not feeling the, the work of the Spirit in your life, you just go and get rebaptized, and And that maybe the Holy Spirit will um, give you more power, more strength, uh, if you kind of feel like you've fallen away. But we believe you only need one baptism. And this is kind of brought out in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, but Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says this, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one Lord, there's only one universal faith that we have, and there's one baptism that we have that is going to bring the forgiveness of sins for you and for me. And, and the church historically has affirmed this. And like I said, it's only until recently where we find that uh, there's churches that disagree with that. Um, but let me give you some quotes from the historical church and, and people that have lived hundreds and, and thousands of years ago. Martin Luther, 500 years ago. Baptism is not a work that we do, but it is a treasure that God gives and faith grants. Now, Martin Luther is building off of stuff that was said a thousand years before him. Augustine of, Him, of Hippo, St. Augustine, or if you live down in Florida, St. Augustine. Uh, but Augustine of Hippo says this, The sins of those baptized in Christ are forgiven. This forgiveness takes place not through man, but through Christ, who himself gave the command to baptize. Cyril of Jerusalem, who lived a long, long time ago, Baptism is God's most excellent and magnificent gift, for it bestows upon us the remission of sins, the gifts of grace, and the sanctification of the Spirit. And St. Athanasius, Athanasius himself said this, For the grace which comes from baptism is the grace of a resurrection, deliverance from sin, and the life eternal. And he also said this, the sacrament of baptism is most holy, by which being cleansed from all sins, we are born again. So we, as a church, for the course of hundreds and thousands of years, have confessed that baptism is a work of God. It is a sacramental work. It is right here for us in the creeds. And it is something that if we confess the creeds, we are called to believe that there is one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, that when we are baptized, the Holy Spirit descends upon us, and that is the work of Christ bringing about the forgiveness of sins and washing away the uh, uh, eternal condemnation um, that we have in our original sin. It is not simply a, a symbolic sign, which a lot of churches, unfortunately, today will say that it's something symbolic that we do um, in our affirmation of wanting to be Christians. Now, that's part of it. And the Bible is very specific. Uh, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So uh, we repent, we, 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 we ask for forgiveness, and, 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 and we receive that. But then um, it, it, through our baptism, we receive then that forgiveness of sins. And, and we are called to make this confession of what we believe. And that's why during the rite of baptism, especially for children, uh, we find a lot of churches that will recite the Apostles' Creed. Some will recite the Nicene Creed as this understanding of this is the confession that unites us and this is the confession that affirms what we believe about the work of baptism through God for us. And so by Athanasius and those with him putting, uh, I believe in, uh, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, that's a powerful statement 
about what we are called to do and how we are called to conduct our churches and how we are called to um, continue the faith uh, for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. We believe that the forgiveness of sins is given to us through the power and the grace of God in holy baptism. So, then we have also, and I look for the resurrection of the dead. That's what it says in the Nicene Creed. And the Apostles' Creed says the resurrection of the body. It's basically saying the same thing. And the life of the world to come, as what the Nicene Creed puts it, and the life everlasting, as the Apostles' Creed puts it. And so, what we confirm or what we affirm in those particular statements is that we believe that there is going to be something more. That this life is not the end. And, and, and it's this idea, this, this understanding um, that, that this world is not uh, the end. The, the promise of eternal life is what we have. And, and it's this idea that uh, Christ died and rose again for something more. That it wasn't just for this world. Now, there, there is something to be said about the nature of, of, of the message of, of salvation for us today. Um, but we as Christians have a hope, a greater hope in something more. This world is tainted by sin. And, and this world is tainted by the flesh. What is to come... The new heaven, the new Jerusalem, uh, the new life everlasting, as the book of Revelation talks about it, it is going to be a place of perfect peace. And, and Revelation promises us that um, uh, all, all tears will be wiped away, uh, that, that all of the pain and the hurt and the suffering of this world will be removed for us. That we are, when we are um, with our Lord, when, when, when we are in heaven, the heaven that is to come, that that those things will not be able to uh, any longer touch us or, or taint us or hurt us or, or, or break us, uh, that we will be in a perfect place, uh, a perfect state of harmony, of grace, of, of eternal praise, of, uh, of the eternal glory of God. And what that means for us is that it gives us something to look forward to, even in the midst of a lot of things not going right in this world. And when things aren't necessarily going right, it's easy to lose hope. But when we confess, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. I look forward to the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. I'm looking forward to an eternity with God. I'm looking forward to spending time seeing my Heavenly Father, my Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit, face to face, and being able to know that I am forever in the presence of of God, that I am not eternally cast off. And, and, and when we affirm these, and when we affirm these things, and, and when it's followed up with the Athanasian Creed, we want salvation to be given to us so that the hope that we have stands strong. And, and if we take time to meditate on these petitions, it's going to strengthen our hope of what is next and we won't always be so burdened or so consumed with all of the hurt and all of the pain that we're dealing with in this life we'll know that god is working through all things to prepare us for something greater and he wants us to pass that on to everybody that yes we affirm that sin has made this world broken in a lot of ways, and it has caused people to rethink themselves, uh, to not see God as a loving God. But when we confess these things, God gives us strength and the spirit and the power to then go and take that message, to continue to preach that message, that people might rethink their view of God, their view of His church, and the necessity of salvation. The creeds are powerful, and they give us so much for our lives today and our lives to come. I want to thank you for joining me on this journey over these last four sessions as we think about the creeds and we think about their message of what we are called to believe about the Word of God as it relates to um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the world and the life around us. So stay strong, make those confessions, 
and take that message to the world. 